Good morning. morning. Welcome. Be seated. Be comfortable. Thanks for coming to the First United Methodist. You're certainly welcome, and we are glad that you made time in your Labor Day weekend to come and worship with us. If you'll look on the back of your announcements, or actually I think it's the inside these days, uh, we'll go over a few of the hot point announcements for the week. Uh, we want to let you know there's an SPRC meeting coming up uh, this Tuesday in the Family Life Center at 7.30, so if you are on the SPRC, uh, please make time to be there for that. Uh, starting in September, uh, the Lord's Army will meet uh, every fourth Sunday, and they'll do that all the way through April. And speaking of the Lord's Army, today is Communion Sunday, and our Communion Rail offering uh, will go to support the Lord's Army and the missions that they do and the outreach that they do right here within our community and elsewhere uh, as they reach out beyond our community with the good deeds that they do. So that will be our communion rail offering today, and uh, we would love it if you would consider supporting that. We have a blood drive coming up on October the 2nd. Mark that on your calendar. Uh, it'll be from 10 until 4, so please, uh, again, mark that on your calendar. And if you can give the gift of life, please uh, consider doing that. Next week, next Sunday, we are starting up the uh, children's choirs and adult chancel bell choir. And uh, that starts next Sunday, September the 12th. And the ages and times are in the bulletin. So if you want to know more, look on the back of the bulletin. Or certainly talk to Ms. Melissa. She'd be happy to tell you more about it. Especially since we had a time change. I'll tell you more. We flip-flopped our adults and kiddos because of some logistical scheduling issues. So our adults will actually meet 2.30 to 3.30. And then our um, we praise will be at 4.00 and our King's Bringers at 4.30. So all the parents are aware, but I'll be sure it gets sent out from logistical, the church. Logistical, what do you say, logistical changes? Or, that had nothing to do with the capital schedule, right? Who? <laughs> <laughs> she stays strong to that bit year after year. Love it. Uh, Ms. Gina has a couple of announcements for us. Good morning. Um, something that's not in the bulletin is that this Wednesday kids programs for like Bible study will start this Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30, kindergarten through sixth grade. So we'll meet in the student building over there and this first night we're just having a fun night, doing some games, doing some fun activities and things like that. So Wednesday at 6.30. And then this Tuesday is the very first day of school for our preschool in the back. So um, we took the kids uh, during Sunday school, we chalked the walk for them. We're praying that it doesn't rain until after Tuesday so that they can have a good entrance and the teachers can see that when they come in in the morning. Um, just to let you know, the building is open over there. If you want to take a peek at classes, it's all set up. We have, this year we have 20 teachers and 109 kids. Wow. We added two more, um, two more classes this year. So we're super excited about that, and we still have a wait list. So, yeah. as a church, we should be very, very proud of our preschool because it is highly sought after, and that people really, really, really want to send their kids to our preschool. And we have my kids live through the program; it's just a super great program. So, so that they know that we support them and that we're praying for them for this school year, for the um, kids and for the teachers. That we're going to do a you know how we usually do a lot of times we do a prayer blanket for people we tie the knots and we pray for the preschool we're going to do a prayer garland i don't know if you've ever seen their um a lot of teachers have them in their rooms they're like a little rag garland they have lots of strips of fabric different colors right here so i have it set up here and all you're going to do is make a loop and pull this, the um, fabric through the loop tie knots say a prayer for the preschool for the teachers for this year and then i'll give it to them on the first day of school on tuesday morning so that they know that we're supporting them for this school year you can do that at the end of service. I'll be over there to help. Or maybe if there's prayer time, during a long prayer time during the service, then you can come up and tie your knot and um, say a prayer for the preschool. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Sheena. And last but not least, of course, our, uh, our youth ministry, 7th uh, through 12th graders, are going out today to Dallas Life, and they're going to uh, serve and help in any way that 
they need uh, manual labor or, or just someone to do something, well, they're going to be there to do that for them. So let's keep them in prayer as they travel to, uh, they can not only be touched themselves by the work they're doing, but also make a difference in the work they're doing. Now, if you would, please stand and greet one another. Please join in our opening hymn of praise this morning from the Methodist hymnal, number 57. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 6. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Microphone here. It's a 
super easy on. You just, I'll be over there. You just put it underneath the cord and make a loop like that, and then you just pull it through the loop. That's all you need. I'll be right there. And pray, right? And pray. Don't forget to pray. Now present God with his tithes and our offerings with the ushers come forward. Lord God, you lavish us with your blessings. Your grace, your mercy pours down upon us like rivers of water. We praise you, Lord, for all that you bless us with. We praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sins, that we might know you, Lord, 
and that we too might get a glimpse of your kingdom and the opportunity to share in your kingdom and your kingdom ministry with all the world. We do pray for the sick and the needy today, and may our gifts and graces and our, that we uh, give tithes and offerings are in our gifts and our graces go to serve those who are in need this day. We commit all our cares to you. We commit this offering to you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we commemorate communion today, let us remember the words from 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The blood will never lose its power. Thank you. 
Please remain standing as we read the gospel reading for today, found in the Pew Bible on page 713, in the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard it about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syria, Syria and Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child laying on the bed, and the demon was gone. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I am continually amazed at the insight, and the power, and yes, even the controversy evoked from the stories of the Bible. And yes, today's story of the Syrophoenician woman and her encounter with Jesus fits this description quite well. It is a shining of God's power through Jesus. It is an insight into how God deals with us. And this passage today has raised a great deal of controversy, especially among Christians. And while it gives us keen insight into the compassion of God, as displayed in Christ's interaction with the woman, the story also has brought about evoked a considerable amount of criticism from what I call the progressive community. And even with our own, in, within our own United Methodist Church, some of the leaders have found this passage in particular controversial. Specifically, they have problems with Jesus' words and even accuse him of being a racist because of some of the things he said to the Syrophoenician woman. Honestly, I don't quite get it. I don't quite understand why someone would see this passage as controversial. It is one of the greatest displays of the mercy and the grace of God in all of Scripture. Clearly, I believe that those who make this accusation have not read this passage carefully. And that happens a lot of times when people make critique of Scripture. It's because they have not read it. And again, read it carefully and prayerfully and humbly. Reading it and seeking what it has to say to us, not trying to read our beliefs into it. Are our values into it? Maybe, maybe it is because they haven't read it or studied it carefully, or maybe there's another reason. Maybe, maybe some of these who critique this passage so are what I call injustice collectors. And every church, every community, every organization, every business, every school has its share of injustice collectors. There's at least one or two in every large crowd. And by injustice collectors, I'm talking about people that, that go around looking for something to critique about someone or something. They look to be hurt. They see someone and just by the look of that person, they expect them 
to hurt them or harm them or say something negative to them. Sometimes it's because that person reminds them of someone who hurt them in the past. Maybe a father, a mother, a brother. And they expect them to say something negative. You know, if you decide you don't like someone, it's easy, and I've been guilty of this, it is easy to start looking for reasons why you don't like them. Looking for reasons to justify you not liking them. Maybe some people have a problem with Scripture and other places, so they're going through and looking for reasons to, put it in modern terms, diss the Scripture. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if my observation is true or not. But my, I do know and have read articles of people who criticize this passage. And yet I believe that it is one of the most insightful stories in all of Holy Scripture. Today's story begins with a journey. It begins with a journey of Jesus going from the region of the Jews to Tyre and Sidon. Uh, Syrophoenicia. Syrophoenicia because it is the place where the Phoenicians settled, the seafaring people, along the coast of the Mediterranean. They settled all the coastline of the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians, they were sailors, and they just settled every port in the Mediterranean. And Syria, because it was part of that Syrian empire. You know, Damascus, Syria, is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. At least it argues to be. There may be some other uh, group arguing that their city is older, but it is the oldest, as far as we know, the oldest continually inhabited area. And the people in there are a Syri Syrian people. And the area was named Syria for a while. This area, this Tyre and Sidon area is that he went is between the two cities. And it is the area that is called Lebanon today. It's the modern day Lebanon. It is a land of Gentiles. This lady spoke a Greek tongue. The Greeks had also settled this area because the Greeks had conquered the entire known world at one time. At least what was thought to be the known or the civilized world. There were some other major empires outside of that area that they were not aware of. There was a long standing civilization in India and China had a very thriving uh, uh, modern civilization. Uh, advanced civilization there, but this was the known world. This was the Greeks had conquered the old Persian Empire, uh, what is modern day Iran now, and then all the areas uh, around that the Persian Empire had conquered, including this area of Syrophoenicia. And so the lady spoke Greek because Greek at one time was the educated language of the day. It was the what they call the lingua de franca, the language uh, of commerce. And she spoke Greek. It's the same reason that our Bible, the New Testament, was first written in Greek because it was the language of trade for the day until the Romans had conquered and then Latin began to take over. So this scripture is a story of a young woman who had a very unwell daughter. I want to say ill or sick, but it wasn't exactly that the daughter was ill. The passage says that she had a demon, demon possession. Now I know a lot of scholars today, Bible scholars in fact, are go through this passage and they focus on that one point and they try to, they spend a lot of time trying to decide just what illness the girl had that it was called demon possession, that it had to be a modern known illness. I will tell you this when reading the Bible. I take it at face value. I try not to read any more or any less into it than what is there. I take the word for it that there was a demon possession, though I may not understand what that means fully. I will just take it at face value. Again, many try to diagnose what is going on, and I think I think there's no need to do that. But the story goes that he left the Jewish area. He went to Tyre and Sidon, the Syrophoenician area, an area of the Gentiles. 
And he went to a house and was trying not to be seen going into the house. He didn't want to be noticed. For what reason? I'm not sure. Maybe he just didn't want to be seen among the Gentiles. Maybe he needed some private time and didn't want to be bothered. That is often the case with Jesus. And here, as he is going into the house, this woman notices him. She hears him. She notices him. And she rushes out from wherever it is that she might have been and confronts Jesus. She gets down on her knees and she begins to cry out for her daughter who is demon-possessed, has a malady of some sort. And I understand that. If you've ever had a sick child, you'll know that there is not much worse than having a sick child. I tell people I would, I would rather be sick myself than have a sick child. Uh, your heart is breaking all the time. It is just, uh, it can be even a desperate feeling to have a child that is ill. And in this case, she was desperate. Desperate enough to even break across these racial lines and talk to a Jew. And even more than that, she was female and she was alone and she was talking to a man. And that was scandalous at that time. But if your child is sick and you see a person who you know can heal the child, you stop at nothing to get that cure. Just imagine, just imagine for a moment how she must have been feeling inside to have this child with this possession. And then what courage it took for her to rush out to Jesus. And when she did, she knelt before his feet and cried out, please cast out the demon in my daughter. Verse 27. Jesus responds to her. He says, he replies to her saying, let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. I think this is the passage that people have a problem with. This particular one. Well, he's calling her a dog. Careful reading of the scripture betrays that. It's not that at all. It's, it's not that at all. If you read carefully, you will understand that it's not. I said betray. That might have been, been the right word. But it. If you read carefully, you understand he is not calling her a dog necessarily. If you look at the top, it says, let the children be fed first. There's your clue. Let the children be fed first. Jesus' mission was to go to the Jews and speak a word of repentance, of faith and repentance to them. Calling them back to repentance. Calling them back to God. Calling them back to faith. That was his mission. That was his goal. And when he says, call, says, uses the term dogs, I think it's obvious that he is speaking about a common saying or term used in that day and time, reflecting the feelings of the Jews toward the Gentiles, that they were dogs. I don't think it reflected Jesus' own personal feelings by any means. If it did, let me ask you a question. If he were so prejudiced against the Syrophoenicians, why would he deliberately go into their territory? Why would he cross the border in the first place to go? And I think he knew he would see her. Apparently, she was expecting him. Apparently she knew who Jesus was and she knew he had the power to heal her daughter. Again, I think the controversy comes from reading this passage in a very cursory way, not giving it the proper attention it needs. A more careful reading, I believe, would indicate, again, that this prejudice wasn't Jesus's, but again, he was speaking a common term, testing her, maybe giving her a clue of some kind. 
but also trying to tell her that what his mission was. But this verse has another purpose. I think it is a pivotal moment. I think it is one of those pivotal moments when you see a change in the mission. Now, first of all, I think God's mission all, all along was to reach out to all of the people of all of the world, to reach out into the Gentiles and to save the Gentiles. I think God's mission was to bring his kingdom to all peoples. But here's where the mission changed because the Jews began to reject Jesus' teaching. And I think it took a turn to go out and to the Gentiles. Again, Jesus was truly prejudiced. Why would he have been going to Tyre and Sidon in the first place? I think it's the stories about the growing of the Gentile community. I think it's a burgeoning of the Gentile mission. You notice she is Greek speaking. You notice also, that, as I mentioned earlier, that the Bible was originally written in Greek. It all seems to start connecting, doesn't it? In a real sense, the story has a larger focus. It's a focusing upon the kingdom ministry. You know, in any organization, or maybe the army or the navy or any group has a task to do that involves large numbers of people, there is a large strategic plan, an overarching umbrella plan, and underneath that are very Various tactical plans or very various uh, minor plans, various minor objectives to fit under the grand strategy. And if you are one of those on one of the one of the smaller missions, you're not always aware of the grand strategy. You focus on your small part, and I think sometimes in God's kingdom we are like that. We cannot see God's big picture. We see our part. We see what we are responsible for. We see those people that God brings to those people, the ones whom we are to minister to and to share the gospel with. But I think if we could see the eyes of God, we would see a much broader mission into the world. And all the crazy things that seem to be happening now, I think if we could see it with God's eyes, to see the umbrella picture, we would understand. Why this or that happened or went this or that way. It is clear that this Syrophoenician woman had great faith. It is clear that she believed in Jesus. It is clear that she had more faith than many of the scribes and the Pharisees. It is clear that she knew that he is the one that could bring healing to his, her daughter. And here you will notice she kind of takes the words of Jesus and plays upon them. She turns them, turns them for her favor. She says, or points out, that even the dogs under the table are privileged to eat the crumbs that fall under the table. Even in the day in which the, the Jews had the soul, uh, had the temple, and it seemed like the mission of God was solely in the hands of the Jewish people, the, of Israel, that even then the gospel would spill over into the lands around. And the truth was, Israel was called into mission so it could go into mission. And Israel failed to reach out across its boundaries. You know, we do that sometimes. It's like we all have a tendency to walk into a room where people are eating and we look around to see if there's anyone we know. Instead of sitting with somebody new or a stranger, we go and sit by the ones we know because it's comfortable. Jesus calls us out of the comfort zones. He calls us to reach people that maybe we do not even, well, understand their tongue. Maybe we don't even understand their language. He calls us to reach out to others. And in this case, there's this turning of the mission to the Gentiles of the world. In other words, what she is saying when she says even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the crumbs, that even the Gentiles are privileged to receive the blessings that overspill from the Lord's table. 
that overspill from Israel. In this story, I think there are several purposes. One tells us about the nature and character of God. In this story, we see a compassionate, caring, outreaching God, a God who is in mission into the world. Two, it tells us about the nature of character of Jesus, that he had compassion upon this woman who probably in, uh, in polite company shouldn't have been talking to. It was a scandal. A lone man didn't talk to a single woman except in public with others around. Never alone. But Jesus had compassion upon her and upon her daughter. That tells us a lot about Jesus. Three, it tells us about the Syrophoenician woman. As I mentioned, and as I mentioned earlier, that the Syrophoenician woman had great faith. Had faith in Jesus. Probably more faith than we have sometimes. I know what it is like to have a sick child. I know what it is like to stay at nights and stay at days worrying about the child. I do know the power of prayer. And I do know the power of God to heal. And I'm sure you have experienced that as well. Finally, this tells us, this passage tells us about how God is establishing his kingdom throughout the world. How he includes not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. People of every race and nation, people of every tongue. But this is actually part two. Did you know that this is part two of the story? Part one is found in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. 1 Kings chapter 17, 8 through 16, to where Elijah goes into a, another land and visits a woman with a sick side who is in need of healing. Today's passage, I don't believe God is erecting banners between uh, barriers between people. I believe he is removing them in order to establish his kingdom throughout the world. My challenge is for each of us to accept the kingdom work God calls us to. No matter how minor or how grand it may be. Whether it be something within our comfort range or outside our comfort range. Our youth today are going to the Dallas Life Center. I'm sure for some they've done it before. It's within their comfort range. But every year I know there's some that it is outside of the comfort range. They see people that they are not familiar with. They meet people they do not know. People whose lives are different than their own lives. And yet our church sees it as important enough to go and make the visit. That God's word might be shared through action. My challenge is that we repent and believe the gospel message of Jesus Christ and that we share it with those who have yet to hear. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>
that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink, this, drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit upon us, your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and all these gifts of bread and wine Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would the ushers come forward? The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. I believe that Hugh has the. Hold on, hold on, hey. <laughs> Wait for the instructions. He's ready to go. Yeah. Hugh has the uh, uh, plate for the rail offering, and that is mentioned in your bulletin. And uh, you have your, you will receive these cups. At the top is a, well, on top is a cellophane film. And if you take the end of that and pull that back, the bread is right under there, the uh, uh, wafer. And then the next tab is a heavy plastic one, and you pull it back and you uh, receive the cup. Let us wait together and we will take communion together. Now, now, now you grab your milk.
Our hymn of invitation this morning is an insert in your bulletin this morning, um, bringing in the sheaves as we look for Labor Day tomorrow. We're reminded that the harvest of bringing in the sheaves can be souls that are saved through the planting seeds of the gospel. As Paul states, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So bringing in the sheaves is the result of our lives lived fully for the Lord. Please stand and join in our hymn of invitation. Spirit abide with you and keep you today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. Amen.